Welcome to The Why Factor, a chance to work out why we do what we do. BBC World Service podcasts are supported by advertising. Two Matisses here. That's a nice Matisse brush drawing. What's that? Oh, that is, it is a Dante Gabriel Rossetti study. Of- Artist John Myatt is showing me his art collection at his home in the English countryside. It's pretty impressive. There's a Gainsborough. Um, another Van Gogh over there, and then a Monet across there on top of the television. As it turns out, that Monet casually hanging over the television isn't really a Monet at all. The drawings that line the staircase aren't really by Matisse either. In fact, none of the pictures here are what they seem. They're all fakes. John Myatt is an expert art forger, so expert, in fact, that his work fooled collectors, dealers and auction houses for years. Until, that is, he was caught. This is The Why Factor on the BBC World Service. I'm Edwina Pittman, and in this week's programme, I'll be looking at why we can't seem to separate art from artist and what that says about us. So this is my studio, and uh, I've got one of my own paintings up on the easel, which I've been working on for a while between jobs. Over there in the corner, there's a a copy of uh, Van Gogh's Starry Night. It's a commission from a customer to do an exact copy. We get asked for pretty much every kind of artist you can think of. Pre-Raphaelites, Gainsborough, Reynolds, Zoffany, David once, I think. More often, the kind of usual suspects amongst the Impressionists, Renoir, Monet, Manet... Cezanne, into the early 20th century, Picasso, Braque, Delaunay, Glaze, Metzinger, and then onward through Andy Warhol, Ben Nicholson, really right up to today. John discovered his skill for copying other people's styles at art college. Later, as a single parent with a young family, he started taking commissions, making what he called genuine fakes for a few hundred pounds each. He never tried to pass them off as anyone else's work until one day he was contacted by one of his regular clients. He said, are you sitting down? And I said, yes, I am. He said, well, do you remember the glaze that you did for me three or four weeks ago? He said, I've taken it into Sotheby's and they valued it at £20,000. So he said, are you interested in uh, £10,000 cash in a brown envelope? And I said, I'm very interested in £10,000 cash in a brown envelope, thank you. It meant, you know a whole lot of things to me. Yeah, it was just everything that I didn't have. But that was the beginning of the crime that went on then for about six or seven years. Over those years, John created about 200 paintings that looked like undiscovered works by well-known artists. Only about 80 of them have ever been recovered, which means 120 John Myatt forgeries are still out there, who knows where. John's business partner forged documents to fake their authenticity before selling them, which might explain why people were fooled for so long, because John himself took no such precautions. I never used proper paints. I always painted with um, emulsion paint that you'd use on the walls of your house. After the children went to bed, I was just clearing the dining table and working on the dining table. And none of this proper easel stuff that you see in here. You know, just for a joke, I was putting silly things like um, KY jelly in the paints and all that kind of thing. It wasn't until I was about halfway through this crime I started taking it seriously, thinking, gosh, I'd better do something or else I'll end up in prison. But end up in prison, he did. There's no doubt that John was committing a crime but his story does illustrate a puzzling point about the nature of our relationship with art. Why should a painting you like become less valuable to you when you discover the artist isn't who you think it is? This isn't just a question of market value. It turns out humans are hardwired to seek out authenticity. We really care about not just what an object looks like or feels like, but where it came from. And the idea that it's a duplicate and we don't know it is both aesthetically destructive, but also we take it as morally appalling. Paul Bloom is professor of psychology at Yale University. He's done numerous experiments testing how we react to duplicates and originals. His findings show that children as young as four are unlikely to accept what appears to be an identical replacement for a favourite toy, even if they can't tell the difference. In other words, authenticity matters to us. Even if we can't tell two objects apart, we want to know we're getting the real thing. What we value 
is dictated by factors that go beyond the perceptual. The human mind typically works by focusing on not just on what something looks like, but what you believe it is, where you believe it came from, the, the morality and the intention of the creator. Paul has shown that caring about the intention of the creator isn't something we learn to do as we get older. It's something we do even as children. For young children, we'll show them paint on a paper, and then we'll tell them different stories. And in one story, we'll talk about this thing being carefully and intentionally created. And the other story, it's something that's spilled or it's just a mess. And when they believe it was intentionally created, they like it more. They think of it as a painting. This shows that a focus on intention and origin is not something that we're drilled in by culture or by society. It seems to show up very early. So we really value the identity and the intention of the creator. But how does this affect what we think something's worth? Money and value are obviously two separate things. The invasion of art by the processes of investing and so forth has actually polluted the ability to see a painting for what it really is. So now you can't see Van Gogh anymore because you know you're looking at 30, 40, 50 million dollars. When you know you're looking at a fake, you are empowered because if you're looking at a fake Van Gogh, you can say, well, it's very good, but it doesn't go with the curtains. John Myatt is clearly a hugely talented painter, but he thinks it takes more than talent to make a living as an artist. One of the things an artist needs is a story. So my story is I'm the guy who went to prison because I was an art forger and I came out and a policeman who'd arrested me called up and said, are you taking commissions? I said, no, I'm going down to the job centre to get a job. He said, oh, forget that. Just do me a family portrait. And while you're at it, he said, a lot of the barristers in the case are interested in having paintings as a memory of the case. You couldn't make it up. If I hadn't spent years being an art forger and going to prison, I could not be making a living as an artist. The crime actually created a backstory for me. So, ironically, John's backstory as a forger has made him a successful artist in his own right. But what happens if we don't like the stories we hear about our favourite artists? Do allegations about an artist's personal life change the way we view their work? And if it doesn't, should it? How should we, for example, now approach the music of Michael Jackson? The films of Woody Allen? Or the paintings of Pablo Picasso? Picasso suffered uh, the mental illness of misogyny. He said, each time I leave a woman, I should burn her. Destroy the woman, you destroy the past she represents. Cool guy. The Australian comedian Hannah Gadsby recently made her feelings about Picasso's personal life pretty clear in her Netflix special, Nanette. And she's not the only one who's got a problem with Picasso. I am calling for museums to provide more information about the male artists whose works that they're showing that have some complicated (laughs) history. Michelle Hartney is an artist whose work often explores feminist issues. I've done a few performance pieces at the Art Institute of Chicago and one at the Met in New York. So I was looking into Picasso and Gauguin at the Met, and I left a wall label on the wall next to each of their paintings. For the Picasso piece, I included a quote from Hannah Gadsby's Netflix special, Nanette, where she talks about Picasso and kind of what are we supposed to do with these men who have done awful things to women. They are put on such a high pedestal and too often we don't get the full truth about their biographies. They brought their misogyny into their work. With Picasso, we know that he treated women horribly. And many of these women are the women that he's painted over and over again. And the same goes for Gauguin. He was painting these 13 and 14-year-old girls 
that he was having sex with and spreading venereal diseases to, yet we're not really supposed to talk about it. I think people just don't want to go there. And when we don't go there, we're really supporting the patriarchy and we're deciding that a work of art is too special and that that really makes us ignore the trauma and the pain that a lot of these men have put women through. I think Picasso would be given a lot of grief if he were still living. I think it's safe to say that novelist Lionel Shriver is not a fan of the biographical approach to art criticism. It's entirely credible that his work would be banned from American galleries because he doesn't fit the model of masculinity for today's world. And whose loss would that be? You could say it was Picasso's loss, but really the bigger loss would be ours. As a writer myself, I want my work to be judged independently of my character. But as well, I want to receive art independently of the character of the artist. You know, I have no problem with understanding how a piece of art came about. Where I draw the line is having to somehow approve of the artist in order to approve of the art. There's nothing wrong with an individual making the decision that they have got uh, bad associations now and it makes them feel bad. I don't want that decision made for me. Institutions or, or people in positions of power are making that decision for the arts consumer. There's a craving for virtue and it means that if your reputation is besmirched, then your work disappears. That scares the daylights out of me. And who are these people? Who's nominated them? to dictate what the norms of behavior are. I like the idea that art can explore everything, and it does sometimes mean uncovering parts of the artist's own character and thoughts that are disagreeable or frightening. We use art to explore some of these dark corners in, if you will, a safe space. That's what gives art so much power. The idea that art is a place where we're allowed to explore the darker aspects of humanity is, I think, a persuasive one. But there is an argument that judging art at face value is a luxury for those who don't have to bear the real-life consequences of some of the more objectionable attitudes held by a few of our heroes. Reading uh, literature for pleasure without questioning the historical and the social context is, in some ways, an elite form of reading because... It is not taking into consideration the material repercussions that such views or such literatures might have. Ananya Mishra is from Sambalpur in India. She's currently working on her PhD in comparative indigenous literatures at Cambridge University. She's also an active campaigner in the movement to decolonise museums, and she puts together alternative tours that reveal the untold histories behind some of the objects on display. She argues that we shouldn't be accepting the canon of artistic works passed down to us without questioning their context. This is because it continues to privilege white Eurocentric culture, especially in countries where the legacy of colonialism looms large. For me, coming from a cultural context within India where I have learnt the English canon in my university syllabus... I would say that there is a need to think that literatures cannot exist beyond the English canon. That is not a recent idea. When colonial invasions were in full progress, they required this idea that the literatures from India, Australia, or the literatures by American Indian writers were not of any value. So the logic of the colonial invasion required that the indigenous culture... Yeah. was deemed unworthy. Yes, yeah. Because it would mean that the indigenous person was not even capable of agency, let alone any creative output. That would basically justify colonial invasions, saying that we would make better use of these lands. We would actually teach these quote-unquote primitives culture that is why I feel that cultural violence is very much related also to expansion of land, and we cannot separate that. And when we are in contemporary literature privileging white voices, 
over literatures by disprivileged communities when we are not making an equal space. We are kind of continuing the same forms of cultural violence. Is there anyone whose views you find difficult, Yeah, but whose artwork you love? I suppose what I'm asking is, if you love Picasso but hate his behaviour, yeah. what do you do then? I cannot make this distinction between a piece of art and the political ideas that the artist holds or what he practices in real life. I think it is a very naive distinction that we continue to make. I think all of it is important, all of it is related. And if it requires to question our so-called literary heroes, if we find them problematic enough to remove them from the canon, it is okay. Of course, writers fall out of fashion all the time as our tastes and attitudes change. But what about removing pictures from galleries? Every time there is a kind of crisis, calls for censorship are very quick to follow as a kind of quick fix. Svetlana Mincheva is the director of programmes at the National Coalition Against Censorship, based in New York. I'm here in the role of saying, no, no, wait a little. How are we going to change society by just changing what's in the museum? What is going to be left in the museum? I grew up in Bulgaria, in a society where there was overt censorship and it was considered to be for the good the government wanted to socially engineer, basically, by giving you positive role models in art. And this is part of what I'm seeing today is part of a generation in the art world, younger people who don't have any clear memory of the McCarthy era here, no clear memory of the 90s culture wars and how important free expression is for the arts. They want a society of equals. They want gender equality. They want racial equality. It's, you know, nobody is against that. But they want to do it by removing from sight everything that is not so good. This, to me, is not helping, but it's also counterproductive because it deflects energies from working on actual social equality, you know, equal pay for women, more access to education, more diversity on the staff of museums and art institutions, things that are very tangible to dragging through artists' past. Why are people so concerned with the identity and the behaviour of a creator of an artwork or their character rather than the art itself? Why is that emphasis shifted? Well, I think we're more economically polarized than ever. And what the art world is good at doing is working in symbols. One of the very important reasons is that the museums themselves have, for a very long time, treated artists as these lone genius figures and not looked very much into the complexity of their personalities. And their job now is to bring more context in to show the work and recognize that it comes from a human being and from a human tradition. So the question that people can't seem to agree on is how much context is enough and who decides what's relevant and what isn't? Perhaps the answer is to have artists with no story at all. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, lot 363, Behold the Future, there it is. Edmond de Bellamy from La Famille de Bellamy, created by Obvious and a GAN algorithm and Ian Goodfellow and... The first piece of art created using artificial intelligence to be put up for auction sold for nearly half a million dollars in October 2018. Art created by AI is a field that's rapidly growing in every genre. So is it easier to separate art from artist when the artist isn't human? Right now, we tend to devalue this artwork. We tend to like it only as a curiosity. Psychologist Paul Bloom thinks that our underrating of AI-created art is again partly due to the value we place on authenticity. But it's also surely because we like our art to be full of the heart and soul of the artist. We might feel cheated if we found out our favourite love song was written by an algorithm. And as we've heard earlier in the programme, we don't like to feel duped. But as it's already been proved in music... Deep learning algorithms will soon have no problem creating artwork that people will find hard to distinguish from human creations. This, for example, is Daddy's Car, a single made by a machine fed on a diet of Beatles songs. 
Bob Sturm is a professor of computer science at the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. A couple of years ago, he and a colleague trained an AI system to generate folk tunes by feeding it 23,000 transcriptions of Irish and English folk melodies. Some people said, well, your machine doesn't have a heart, doesn't have a soul. How can it create anything that's worthwhile? It doesn't know the hardship and the toil of human existence. It doesn't know anything about national identity or folklore. Folk music comes from the heart, it comes from the people. To have a computer generated just doesn't make sense. But Bob was pleasantly surprised by what his algorithm came up with. So plausible were some of the tunes, in fact, that Bob released an album of them. He made up a backstory for it, but didn't reveal that the music had been generated by computer. It was very well reviewed in the press. After about six months, we sent an email to people who have said things about the album and told them the real story about the experiments. And to our surprise, nobody changed their mind about the music. That They still said it's a wonderful album. They were sad about the backstory not being true, but that they continued to appreciate the album and the musicianship that went into the album. A newspaper ran a story about the truth behind Bob's album and put an extract of some of the music up on its website. People were not complimentary. There were a variety of comments about, oh, that sounds robotic, it's cold and lifeless, just I'd expect. These are just nerds that are trying to take over folk music and they have no musical talent whatsoever. But here's the thing. The newspaper had used the wrong bit of audio. People were reacting to a genuine piece of folk music that had nothing to do with AI. So what does all this say about how we approach art? It seems we can't separate it from the artist because of our inherent bias. That means sometimes we hear what we want to hear and see what we want to see. Like the fans of Irish music who think they hear algorithms, not folk rhythms in music, which they believe to have been composed by computer. And there may still be as many as 120 collectors around the world who love that rare old master painting on their wall without realising they're actually by master forger John Myatt. It also means that sometimes we may not want to know about the life of an artist because we fear it'll change the way we feel about their artwork. One thing all today's guests seem to agree on is that separating art from artist is only possible if we disregard context. That's not easy to do, and I'm not convinced we should be doing it anyway. After all, at the heart of an artwork is the artist. The truth is, we seek cultural authenticity because great art, music and literature is an expression of the human condition. And surely, the more we know about that, the better. This edition of The Y Factor was produced and presented by me, Edwina Pittman. Our editor is Richard Knight and the sound engineer was Rod Farker. Previous episodes are available to stream or download online. And if you want to get in touch, do email us at yfactor at bbc.com.